What's the common point between fiction, fake news, illusions, and meditation? They can all be studied with Bayesian statistics, of course. In this mind-bending episode, Dominic Makovsky will for sure expand your horizon. Trained as a clinical neuropsychologist, he's currently working as a postdoc at the Clinical Brain Lab in Singapore, in which he leads the reality-bending team. What's reality bending, you ask? Well, you'll have to listen to the episode for that. But I can already tell you, we'll go through a journey in scientific methodology, history of art, religion, and philosophy. What else, right? Beyond that, Dominic tries to improve the access to advanced analysis techniques by developing open source software and tools like the NeuroKit package in Python or the base test R package in R. Even better, he looks a lot like his figures of reference. Like Marcus Aurelius, he plays the piano and the guitar. Like Sisyphus, he loves history of art and comparative mythology. And like Yoda, he is a wakeboard master. Yeah, maybe that was an overstretched comparison to fit into that introduction. I don't know. I'll let you be the judge of that. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 55, recorded November 25, 2021. <music> Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, and reach a true Bayesian state of mind by visiting learnbayesstats.com. That's learnbayesstats.com. Do you want to support the podcast and unlock exclusive Bayesian swag at the same time? Then you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash stats. Starting at 3 euros, you can get various benefits like the private MBS Slack channel, early access to special episodes, selecting questions for episodes, or even coming on the show. You'll get more details at patreon.com slash stats. Thanks a lot, folks. I'm very grateful for any support you can bring let me show you how to be a good busy and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Wes Abazian is someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. Abazian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen, maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming how would i know unless i'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like i'm richard Feynman. dominique makovsky bienvenue dans learning bayesian statistics hey thanks for having me here it's truly a great pleasure and honor to be in your show and merci <laughs> beaucoup de mon savoir yeah, so you were hesitating shall i shall i answer in english shall i answer in, in french but no let's switch to english because i heard this language is spoke by more people than French. I was shocked by that. French is so easy. Yeah. It's Terrible so easy. news. I don't understand why people don't learn that. I'm happy to have you on the show for several reasons. First, you're the second French guy to be on the show after Rémi Louf. So that's nice. I'm discovering more and more that there is a French Bayesian community. So that's, that's good news. Mm-hmm. Second, you are working on uh, super interesting topics and uh, like I, I can't wait to, to go into, into those. I'm super interested in that. It's going to be very original on the show, so it's going to be great. And third, I want to thank Panos Mavros, one of the podcast's patrons, for introducing us. I had the pleasure of meeting Panos in person recently and your name came up. So thanks a lot, Panos, for for this introduction and for this episode. Okay, so now let's start as usual with your Marvel origin story. Who, which superhero are you? So yeah, basically, because you seem to be into psychology since at least your undergraduate studies, but I don't know, maybe it is since you were five. So how come and then how did you end up in the stats and in the stats and open source uh, world? Well, to be entirely honest with you, my initial goals, goal was to be a, a hmm. musician in a rock band and psychology was only my second choice, but uh, well, here we are. And um, But actually in high school, I, I hesitated between essentially philosophy and biology. And it was only in the last year that I heard about this thing called, you know, 
psychology and neuropsychology in particular. And I, and I thought like, oh, this sounds, this sounds great. This sounds like a nice combination, you know, of my, um, of my interests. This is what I should do. And so my um, initial love is for really to clinical neuropsychology. So working with patients, understanding how psychiatric or neurological disorder work, how to, how we can diagnose them, how we can assess them and so on. But very early, I knew that research was kind of the thing that I wanted to do for my main job rather than working as a clinical psychologist. And actually my first exposure, professional exposure, you know, we, in France, we have an internship at the end of middle school, like oh, a right. one week kind yeah. of uh, experiment in, uh, in some workplace. And my workplace was a, a huh. biology lab. So in a way, you know, research was always kind of here, I guess. And so that's why then I, I pursued a dual route. So clinical neuropsychology and research for my bachelor and master, and then went on to continue on a PhD. But I have to mention that at this point in time, my relationship with statistics and, you know, Bayesian stuff was close to zero or, or like minus a hundred, depending on what the, what the scale is. I had really fairly bad grades and, you know, I just, I didn't like it. And, um, what changed is basically that I, I, I started to do my first semi-serious kind of research project in the first year of master. And it was really on a topic that I, I really loved. It was on um, the development of, I mean, it was on neuroaesthetics and it was on the development of the aesthetic judgment. So, you know, I designed the experiment. I picked up like, you know, paintings, works of art. I designed the questions, the measures, and I started, started to collect data in children and adults. And, um, our hypothesis is that the the aesthetic judgment is usually characterized by, you know, a lot of self kind of related processes. We like, especially children, for instance, they, they, we, we expected that they would say, oh, I like this painting because it shows a rabbit and, you know, I like fluffy rabbits and I like animals. So therefore I find this painting beautiful. But gradually there would be some sort of detachment going on and Mo and maybe adults would kind of base their aesthetic judgment on more objective criteria. For instance, you know, harmony of colors, symmetry, meaning, balance, contrast, I don't know. And the idea was kind of to go against the, the common trope, you know, that the beauty is in the eye of the beholder and rather to investigate that maybe actually adults or, or some adults at least, you know, have a more objective aesthetic judgment, or at least an aesthetic judgment that is based on more objective criteria. And so we theorized that one of the mechanism of this possible detachment was cognitive inhibition. Uh, and so we recorded like, you know, different measures of aesthetic judgments and different cognitive abilities. And here, I mean, and this is where basically the trouble began because I had all of these, you know, all of these different measures. I knew intuitively what I wanted to do with them. You know, I wanted to see the relationship between inhibition and its particular developmental trajectory and how it relates to aesthetic judgment, but I just didn't know how basically. And so I remember I, you know, I, I struggled in Excel. I had this big, all this data. I used like conditional formatting with all the colors. I had, you know, all the graphs and many descriptive data, but basically no statistics. And at the end of the day, at the end of the year, I remember I managed to get a correlation matrix, a big correlation matrix between like all the variables. And I went on and started discussing, you know, the ones where there was significant stars. And I was like, oh, okay, so this is, I started like over-interpreting. And the reviewer of my, of my master thesis said, oh, did you correct the p-values? I was like, huh, you know, what, what does it even mean? And he said, basically, if you didn't correct the p-values, this is all worthless. And so that was very, very, you know, sad and disappointing. And, um, and it was unfortunate because I couldn't continue on the same topic for the, for the, for the master two thesis, because we have to work with patients. Uh, so I changed lab and changed topic and continued on the topic that became my PhD. And, um, yeah, but this is, and this is the start of the, this is where basically my trajectory kind of collided with the world of R statistics and open source. I would say I remember very vividly like the two things that got me into R, uh, if, if you're interested to, to hear that. 
But to give you some, some, I guess, background information, you have to know that, you know, at least in my university, the teaching of statistics in psychology was v not the best, to say the least. And basically during the first years, you know, all the teaching is very, very theoretical. You know, I remember we have all the, the, the formulas to remember to, to do ANOVAs by hand. You know, we had to look up p-values in big tables. And it was just crazy. And, you know, compared to other lectures or like psychopathology or cognitive science, you know, statistic lectures were fairly unpopular. And then after the, the first few years, they shift entirely their perspective and it becomes like a very hands-on how to get results with one software called Statistica. And so we have like screenshots or where, where to click in order to, you know, do correlations, factor analysis and so on. And at least in my, in my opinion and in my experience, this, I mean, this way of teaching, so first like a lot of theory and then a very specific kind of hands-on, hands-on experience is kind of, um, is kind of backwards, I would say, or it's the, 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 the other way around. So yeah, so here I was on my, working on my master two project and, you know, in my lab, I mean, in my class, like all the people they wanted to pursue a PhD started to hear about this, you know, this famous letter called R and, you know, it was like, oh, this is a very useful skill to have, but it's very tough. It's very hard. And it's, and it's unlike anything we've ever done in psychology because we had no courses on like programming or computer science, you know, whatsoever. And so one day I went ahead and installed R and R Studio and I watched a few tutorial videos and there was a website from which you could, you can copy paste, you know, like uh, all the functions. So I went on to try some of them and this was the first kind of revelation. I run a function, I didn't know what it was and it gave me like this super, you know, bootstrapped cluster analysis of my data with like many significant stuff. I was like, wow, that's so great. With just one line, I can do all that. And then the question became, I mean, became, you know, what it is, what am I doing basically? And, and this is how I started to, you know, dive into what the arguments, reading the documentation basically, and learning just about statistics. Yeah. So I think that trying first and, you know, because there's nothing more demoralizing than when you try something and, you know, you spent hours with like struggling with some error message, like red, you know, some, some, something that pops up. And so, yeah, this idea of like having stuff that runs and then from there, basically investigating what it means is kind of one of the philosophy underlying some of the packages that I later developed, such as for instance, easy stats. And the second thing that made me fall in love with R was uh, Nitter and Markdown. I, I don't know if you, if you, if you heard about it, but basically when you you know, you can write a manuscript directly in R, I mean, in R Studio, and then you click in a button, you know, with statistics and all, and it shows you this beautifully rendered PDF or even website. And this for a master student was absolutely great. And, and yeah, from then on, all my supervisor had, supervisors had to struggle with like pages and pages of supplementary materials, you know, with all the statistics and all. But, um, yeah, that was the really the, the, the spark of my, um, I would say, love relationship with R. Yeah, even though the, there was already, I mean, just at the end of my master, there was already a shadow lurking in the corner, like, um, you know, a snake uh, tempting me with, uh, with, uh, with an apple. And it was Python, basically. Because one of the very important skills that you, in psychology, at least, is to, you know, we have to create experiments, right? You know how these behavioral experiments where we collect like reaction time, you know, responses and, and stuff like this. And I wanted to, to, I had an idea of an experiment and I wanted it to be fairly flexible, but the only way to do it was to use closed source software. At least that's what they did in my lab back then. And it's not even that I don't like, you know, big corporation making a ton of money out of uh, poor researchers, but it was just that I need, I wanted something more open and more flexible really. And my, one of my PhD colleagues said, oh, I know a bit of Python. We can do that. Let's write it in Python. And so we started to to basically, you know, and at this point I was fairly comfortable with R, but R is not a real programming language, right? It's very interactive and very, almost by design, you know, you type something, you enter something and it gives you some results, you know, it gives you a figure, some, some statistics or, or, or whatever. But here the goal was to, we had to monitor like the keyboard input, you know, present stuff on the images on the screen. And so it was a, 
Python was good for that. And so we started to, to write this horrible script, you know, with like super long spaghetti code in Python. And then we thought like, is there a way of, instead of repeating the same code over and over again to somehow like make it more modular. And this is how we discovered, for instance, functions, you know, that we can have like snippets, encapsulated snippets of code that we can reuse. And we're like, oh, that's absolutely, a, you know, such a great invention. And then we had, you know, two experiments. And at the, at the beginning of both, we had like all these functions defined. And we were also thinking, mm, this is not, you know, the most uh, efficient. There must be a way of like moving all of them into a third kind of third party place to reuse them. And this was how the, my first real package was basically born in your side. And this is a, yeah, incidentally how I, how I learned parcel tonk and so, and software development. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for these, uh, detailed answer. And yeah, it's funny how like there is a lot of, uh, randomness in that, in, in that pass. So I, I love that. Yeah. And it's very, yeah, random, but, uh, but then, you know, it, it's like it accelerated at this point, yeah. like it was the slippery slope. And then I rolled down into like, mm -hmm. you know, GitHub starting writing uh, another software yeah. for R and so on. And, but in the end, I mean, they, the stuff that I wrote really like helped me a lot for my PhD. I mean, it was pretty much what saved my, hmm. my PhD. So, um, and it kind of paved the way too, because, you know, I was learning these languages as I wrote these first kind of packages, but then it paved the way for more like mature or more large scale projects like, you know, easy stats for NeuroKit too. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I completely resonate with what you're, you're saying, although I didn't do a PhD, but it, it was basically the same for me. Like I, when I started discovering Python and, and the fact that you could simulate samples from probability distributions instead of doing pen and paper computations, I was like, wow, but like, why didn't people teach me that? I would have been much more interested in, in statistics otherwise. And then from there, it just uh, became natural to get into open source because Python is open source. So like you, you do some PRs, you do some, you, know, you do some issue finding, then some PRs, then just it, yeah, it rolls uh, pretty naturally. And, and yeah, it can, it completely changed my career, for instance. It seems like it, it changed yours too. So that, that's pretty powerful. And, but what I, what I like is so that, um, so you were really interested from pretty early on in these neuropsychology topics and you were able to, to pursue them like even, even today. So I'm, uh, I'm actually curious to, to go into that now. And, and could you, could you actually define what you're doing nowadays for our listeners? Well, nowadays, I think that I would say 80% of what I'm doing is watching at some R or hmm. Python code and endlessly tweaking the parameters of the figures in ggplot or whatnot. And the rest is split between uh, creating new GitHub projects and repos and, uh, and yeah, and binge watching some very obscure YouTube videos. So that's my, that's my kind of, that's how my day looks like. But, um, so I, yeah, I guess my work is basically on one side, there is the fundamental research on, uh, on reality bending. And then there is also a big component, which is the open source projects that I'm engaged and involved with. And yeah, and I mean, and both these sides, like the fundamental research, as well as the more software development kind of side bring me, uh, you know, a lot of, of joy and, and collaborating on, on projects like easy stats, the, the easy stats are our packages, you know, it has really had a kind of a positive ripple effect on me. You know, I met a, a great people and shout out to, you know, the easy stats team, uh, you know, Daniel, Matan, uh, Indra and Brenton and because without them, the project would have, you know, wouldn't have existed. And on top of it, this project also increased my knowledge of stats because, you know, the problem of having an informal education as I, as I had is that, you know, you, you never feel you have the imposter syndrome, basically, no matter what you do, you know, you're always unsure and, um, yeah. And so basically, and also there is a real problem that you don't know the basics, you know, like many times I. I discovered something very, very late, you know, like some statistical concept. And I was like, how could I have lived, you know, so long and, you know, and like publish papers and all without knowing it. And so, 
yeah so but thanks thanks to you know the community and thanks to these kind of open source packages and 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 all the stuff i learned like like never before it's really uh yeah, a great ride. Yeah, thanks for that. Perfect. Now we know what you do. And it sounds like we kind of have a similar job. I'm wondering whether it's the same or not. <laughs> so I see how Bayesian Stat fits into all this. And then do you remember when you got introduced to Bayesian Stats and why you were uh, attracted to them? That's a great question. I think that um, the first time I heard about Bayesian, you know, the word Bayes or Bayesian, was um, came from my PhD mentor, Marcos Perduti, who introduced me to the Bayesian brain hypothesis. And so it was kind of this, this novel, fairly recent neuroscientific framework in which the brain is not seen as a computational machine, you know, it's not seen as something that receives input, processes it, and then provides some output, but rather the brain is seen as a predictive machine. And that is that the goal of the brain is really to, you know, constantly generate predictions and test them against the sensory input. So this is, for me, initially the Bayesian, you know, the, the Bayesian statistics or the Bayesian the word was connected more to this neuroscientific framework and to this neuroscientific concept. And it was only later that, you know, when I was playing with R, I came across this Bayesian statistics and there was like, oh, you can run a Bayesian regression just by basically changing the name of the function, you know, instead of having like LM, no, 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 you have, you change it and you, and you can have Bayesian regression. I was like, oh, that's so cool. That sounds, uh, that sounds fancy. Let's try it. And again, I just run it and it starts, it, it started to show like all the iterations, you know, like, I was like, wow, I don't know. Again, I don't know exactly what I'm doing, but it looks, you know, very interesting. And so, and this is where I basically started to use, um, I mean, to go into the Bayesian world and to use more and more Bayesian model and the whole framework. So, and the reason I would say, you know, nowadays, the reason why I use it is not really because it's fundamentally better or fundamentally more accurate, I would say. The reason why I personally use it most of the time is because it's just more flexible, you know. I can run models like, I don't know, general additive uh, scale location kind of models that I cannot do, I just simply cannot do it in another framework. And so that's, that's thanks to like geniuses, like, you know, Paul, Paul Bruckner and, and the Stan team, which made it very, very easy to, to run all these powerful models. But, um, yeah, nowadays I mostly use the Bayesian statistics in order to have these particular kind of models. And, um, but even then, I mean, you know, my, my, my mentor always said that using these kind of fancy models is like basically shooting a fly with a, with a bazooka. And, you know, there is some truth to it. It's like when you have very clear results, very robust kind of results, you know, no matter what approach, statistical approach do you use, in the end, the conclusion is usually the same. But then I think more recently, I kind of also shifted my own mindset. You know, I started to move away from just like testing effects, testing, you know, differences, but more towards like really trying to model the process that's going on. And from there, you know, once you have basically a good model that represents the process, you can then investigate like differences within, within it, you know, contrast or whatnot. But, but this actually requires like a lot of advanced kind of methods, like marginal means, marginal contrast and so on. And so, you know, it's not, uh, it necessitates, I mean, these advanced models are necessary in order to do this. So, um, yeah, to go back to your original question, I think that my, nowadays my usage of, of, Bayesian of Bayes in general is like there is on the one hand the research part in which this framework that I use, you know, to discuss my results, to implement and design experiments. And there is also on the statistical part in order to get like, a, you know, advanced models. But uh, they are not, you know, these two aspects are like they both use Bayes, but they are not necessarily super connected. Like I could do one without the others. And many people do. Bayesian neuroscience without Bayesian statistics and vice versa. And so that's an interesting kind of, you know, it's crazy that a, a statistical uh, framework is used, can be used like, you know, on, on, on a fundamental and theoretical level, as well as on a very practical <laughs> and applied level. Yeah, definitely. Level. That was uh, what I was going to say. So you come from a very practical motivation into, into this. And, and that's not, that, that's actually, I think the majority of people from that I encounter, uh, then they get interested into the 
the abstract and philosophical framework, but uh, they rarely go into that through the philosophical route, which makes sense, especially when you're in research and like are, are doing stuff like you, like you have a model and you want it, you basically want it to fit and you don't really care about the philosophical framework because also it's less yeah. of your interest. You know, no. your interest is really the, the experiment you are running, for instance, or the subject matter mm -hmm. of your PhD. Yeah, yeah. But one of the, I mean, to be fair, the one of the big limitations that I, that I faced is getting easier now, but it was like, you know, a few years ago, these methods were very not popular, even in like in psychology or neuroscience. And it was, and especially, you know, once you have your model, what to do with it, like how to report it, because reviewers are expecting some, something, right? They expect, if not p-values, they expect some sort of indices. And so I found that initially it was kind of hard to, you know, do this last mile of research, like between the results the statistical model and the manuscript, you know, what is written in the paper. And so that's why probably also like um, some of the, of the, of the software like psycho or easy stats are also meant, you know, geared toward this post-processing of models. Like once you, because there are in R, there are so many packages for fitting crazy models, but then we, we try to provide like a consistent API to, you know, to report them, to turn them into nice tables with all the information and so on. And that's particularly tough in the Bayesian framework because like, you know, the different indices, they change, you know, from year to year, you know, the, for a few years, the base factor is like the, the, the coolest, the cool, the cool kid in town. And then it's like, uh, it's more criticized and other indices come. So yeah, it's a, it's a very vibrant field. Yeah. Yeah. I completely get that. And actually now let's, let's focus a bit on your, on your research because so you, you work on aspects of reality bending. So I had never heard of that. So can you explain us what that is? I didn't hear about it either. Before uh, the show? Before, uh, <laughs> or before, do, before starting to do it, basically. So more... Uh, <laughs> so yeah, reality bending is, I would say currently, is mostly the name given to the research direction that we are pursuing here in, in my in Singapore, in my small team of, you know, three fantastic colleagues, but it's, uh, it's more, I mean, on a theoretical level, it's more of an umbrella term to cover all the different kind of processes and mechanisms that are involved in the sense of reality. And the sense of reality is basically a feature or a part of consciousness that combines the belief and the feeling that, you know, we are, that what we experience is real and that we ourselves are real. And so the problem is that there are many distinct kind of um, mechanisms that usually belong, traditionally, they belong to separate fields. For instance, there is like a uh, concept from cyber psychology, like presence, immersion. There is also things from uh, more embodied cognition, like interoception. There is, of course, consciousness science, you know, altered states of consciousness but even cognitive control, but they are, they all, you know, belong to their own field and, you know, with specific framework, specific theories. And I intimately kind of believe that, you know, they are all important for the sense of reality. And so in order to have a, you know, a, a, a nice comprehensive painting of that phenomenon, we should study basically them all. And so reality bending is really kind of the, the term to cover all of this. And um, yeah, the central idea is also that the, the sense of reality is, you know, is fairly flexible. You know, it, it changes throughout the day, you know, when we sleep, for instance, in dreams or when we are watching a movie, when we are engaged in some activity, you know, it's fluctuating and it can sometimes also go to almost abnormal states, for instance, like in, like in some pathologies like the depersonalization, derealization disorder, in which, you know, people feel themselves or the world as, you know, real, I mean, unreal or strange. So yeah, that's the gist of reality bending is like all the mechanisms that are involved in changing and giving birth or giving rise to the sense of reality. Okay. Yeah. They, this is very interesting and kind of sounds like you're giving me the plot for matrix or rather the matrix gave me the plot <laughs> for reality bending. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. And so these topics can be like, so you can 
how can you estimate or like see as a researcher how the sense of reality changes for people like are there like some activities that we do where you are able to measure that and and say okay it's interesting because here like the the, the sense of reality of that person is changing because of that is that what you're trying to do even yes i mean that's a very good question and very at the same time tough question is basic because i the assumption that we make and that has been made for you know thousands of years is that we can alter our consciousness states and that you know there are different ways of doing it you know one of the most common ways for instance by you know ingesting some some drugs like psychedelics for instance that would have a direct effect on the on consciousness and on yeah on our consciousness state but they are also other possible ways of of modulating the sense of reality uh, you know for instance like the practice of some i mean some practices like let's say meditation you know hypnosis but even some physical exercise or dance can also probably i mean people you know d- describe this like feeling of being in the zone you know being in another kind of state you know even when of course when we dream and there have also been attempts of altering consciousness via other means for instance i don't know if you've heard about binaural beats you know it's the is the process of like delivering two different frequencies but close but different frequencies of sound in the two ears and basically this creates an illusory kind of frequency that is created by the auditive system and the one of the assumption is that this would somehow modify the you know the the frequencies in the brain and would like sync it in a you know in a different way and so but the, the few studies that have investigated this phenomenon are fairly the conclusions are not so clear basically whether it works or not there have been other attempts also to study drums because like one of the you know one of the very common feature of many shamanistic practices around the world and we believe from you know from basically from a from a very long time is the use the usage of drums and in particular the idea that you know some drum patterns around 10 hertz or 1 hertz which is like 10 hertz is the dominant kind of frequency in the in the eeg in the brain and so the reason why i mean this drumming repetitive pattern would somehow also alter the frequency distribution in the brain and the, therefore the connectivity and would basically help the shaman and the public to enter in some altered states of consciousness and again there have been a few studies on drumming too but fairly inconclusive so this is still us you know how we can consistently manipulate conscious the, the the consciousness state without using you know psychedelics or other drugs is still an area of investigation and for instance also virtual reality is also used you know to go beyond reality which is uh, something that i really like and you know the idea that in virtual reality you can modify the, the laws of physics or the you know you can modify your own relationship to the world and it creates this very bizarre consciousness state so that's yeah one thing is how we can modulate the consciousness states and what are the altered states of consciousness that, that that are happening naturally because like you know some people there is also a lot of variability between people right some people are very sensitive like for instance to hypnosis some people would describe very vivid dreams with uh, almost some level of control over them while for some others it seems like the variability is fairly you know maybe less or in different or yeah or shows in different kind of contexts so that's one thing on its own but then the second problem that you mentioned which is even tougher is how do we how do we measure it you know as scientists you know one of the reliable ways is like having you know a, a bunch of scales of questions like subjective reports you know asking them whether they felt this way or that way there are questionnaires that have been validated for you know like psychedelic like trance state so that's one way but then we would like i mean you know as neuroscientists we would like some some markers that are more objective i guess so we have been also looking at the trying to find robust markers in the brain like in the eeg signal or in the fMRI and that's really a field um, that is basically growing and there is still a lot to do it's still fairly unclear what are the most robust kind of markers where, where whether it shows in the connectivity between the brain regions or whether altered states could also show in the complexity of the signal you know like the 
the entropy and the fractal dimension of the brain signal. So yeah, this is really um, one of the big challenge of the field is to isolate like paradigms and procedures to to have altered states and also some markers to you know assess them and measure them and quantify mm. them. Yeah. Yeah, and I can see how difficult that, that could be. <laughs> and that's not even mentioning like all the altered states in pathology, you know, like in, for instance, the flashbacks in PTSD or in the, the instability of reality in some forms of schizophrenia. So there is also the, the mm. whole clinical kind of, uh, you know, side to it. Yeah, and I can guess that like since most of those markers are probably in the brain and that we still have a, a, like a, not, not that deep uh, knowledge of the brain, like it makes it even more complicated because like there, there are probably some parts where you should look at but you are not because you don't even know about it and that makes it even more difficult oh totally and even more than that the, the worst i mean the worst and the best thing i guess for a researcher is that the same result can be reinterpreted based on a different framework like for instance you know in in neuropsychology one of the most kind of staple finding that we had is the one of the brain region, the Broca region, was involved in language. And so it was for you know many years it was considered considered as the the origin of or not the origin, but the yeah, a brain region that is devoted essentially to language. And more recently someone, you know, for instance, was studying like the combos that we do in video games, you know, like up, 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 down, down, uh, left, right, and so on. And he did this in an fMRI and what he showed was that Actually, the brain region that was activated in this combo kind of execution was also the same Broca language area. And, you know, it's at first sight, it can seem a, a bit weird because like, it doesn't have much to do with language. But when you think about it, you know, what is language? It's like the combination of like lower elements, you know, like words into higher, you know, into, into more complex elements like sentences, you know, that have meaning. And what is a combo is also the combination of, you know, a, a pattern into, or rather of elements into a, a more general pattern. And so maybe this brain region is not involved in language per se, as we thought for so many years, but rather in this, just this, the mere construction of uh, the building, you know, combining building blocks together. And so we, you know, we have reinterpreted a whole, you know, a lot of studies, a lot of results, and this happens over and over again. And that's, you know, very, very interesting. Yeah. And it adds to the, to the complexity, I guess. From what you said, I'm wondering whether things like fiction and magic qualify as reality bending experiences or not? Well, fiction, yes. Initially, initially my, my PhD was on the paradox of fiction. So it was on the question of why do we have feel emotions towards fiction, something that we know is not real. And it's true that when you think about it, like, you know, why would the body and everything react when something that has no yeah. real importance for our survival? So that was basically the, the question. So we, definitely what we showed is that when the mere fact of believing that something is not real, even for the same emotional stimulus, just the fact of thinking that it's not real decreases like the emotional response. So it has, um, you know, even the body and the, and the brain reacts or are kind of, um, the reaction is lowered by this, uh, by this belief. So fiction is definitely a way of modulating our sense of reality, more likely this belief kind of component rather than the, a more, f rather than the feeling, but, uh, still as to magic, that's a good question. You know, I would say that magic is definitely, it's, it's playing on the problems or, or on the limitations of attention. You know, we have a, a very good sensory and attentional system, but it has, it can be easily tricked, you know, like the same happens with illusions, visual illusions, even though we know that, you know, this, these two lines are the, of the same length, we cannot stop, but seeing them, you know, as being bent or, you know, of different sizes. And I think same goes with, with magic. It's really like a play on our, the limitations of our attentional and or visual systems. Okay. That's, uh, that's fascinating. And then let's try to get in, in into a bit more details because can you tell us anything about the mechanisms by, by which these beliefs and these feeling of reality can be altered and if there are any consequences to that? Well, as for the cognitive mechanisms involved, there are, I mean, at least what we are currently investigating in, in the current studies, there are two main fields, I would say. There is on the one hand cognitive control, so the executive functions, you know, the, the abilities that allow us to like control our thoughts, to plan ahead and to manipulate information. And so this, 
this is likely to play some kind of role in some of the altered states of consciousness because we can see that there are either the brain regions involved in that are either disconnected sometimes or they can be also necessary. For instance, in the case of fiction, the emotion regulation mechanisms that is done by fiction could be mediated by these kind of cognitive control mechanisms that are implicitly recruited. And another range of mechanisms could be the interoception, basically the the ability and the the process of feeling our bodily and internal signals and to be aware and eventually influenced by them. Because one of the findings that we observed is that the sense of reality is strongly, strongly connected to the body. You know, it's like whenever something affects the body, it seems like we tend to believe that it is more real. And if something doesn't, like if even if you show something emotional, but the body doesn't react for one reason or another, the judgment of reality is usually less strong. So interoception and cognitive control seem to be two possible mechanisms by which this could work. But there is also, of course, like more the all the self-related processes that are definitely involved. These processes are related to the the core self, right? That's what that's what you're basically saying. Yes, or some people would have would argue that our conscious mm-hmm. experience, you know, the the perception of reality, basically, or the the perception and experience of reality, is the self. Or in other words, like if I take you know right now your conscious experience, actually all the information about who you are, you know, how you relate to your thoughts, to your past memories, is somewhere in this experience at this precise moment. You know, it's often transparent to us because it creates kind of the the scaffolding or the structure of our conscious experience. But it's likely that we are really seeing and experiencing the world through all these self-related processes. So... That's what, that's also one of the, the axes that we are trying, that we are planning to study is how the subject, the, the experience of reality can inform us about oneself, like stable traits, like personality, for instance, or, or things like that. And, and this idea has been actually explored in like early, I mean, in psychoanalysis, you know, remember the, the Rorschach ink blood tests. So these kind of black ink blobs. And, you know, they were asking patients to tell, what they see in it. And the assumption is that people would project their internal mechanisms, their consciousness or different, you know, components of this consciousness onto this ambiguous material. And so by analyzing the responses, they could make inference about, you know, who these people are, what they have, what disorder, and so on. So this idea has been a bit dismissed in uh, modern science. And in general, all the implicit measures about personality, so measures that are, you know, do not require to ask actually people about personality, do not work so well, unfortunately. But nonetheless, yeah, I think it's a really interesting idea, you know, that our perception and experience of reality is really shaped by who we are. And that in turn, if we manage to assess or quantify or measure the way we one person experiences the world, we could also make inferences, you know, back, backwards inference about who they are. And so this dual link between like the self, the experience of reality and vice versa is, uh, yeah, it's really, an, I think, an interesting question. And I, we will see if, if it leads somewhere. Yeah, that's interesting. And that's something that makes me think about this. Then if you could change the, your self-image, okay, so your perception of yourself, does it change your, your conception of reality and, and how you see the world and, and basically reality? Like, do you change your reality when you change yourself? Now that you mention it, they have been experiments that are doing... Um, so, for instance, you know, there is uh, one of the famous experiments is the, the rubber hand experiment in which you make... There is a, basically a rubber hand, so a, like a mock piece of, of an arm. And then the by stroking and, and by some procedure, you make people believe that it's their own kind of arm. And then you really see that the, the whole body, the perception of the body really changes. And when you then, when you threaten the hand or when you like, you know, when you do something to the hand, it, they, people really be, react as if it was their own, even though they know, you know, consciously on a higher level, they know that it's not their hand, but it's just like the, 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 
the representation of the body really changes. And is the I've read some studies that did what you suggest. They embodied people in different bodies. I know that it has been done with like adults in in, ki- in the bodies of kids, or like by changing also the you know the the weight. It was in in the context of the study of um, anorexia, I think, and they changed like you know the bo- the bodily shape, and they did that also recently. I think with like embodiment in diff- in virtual reality, they, they did this, and they did this with like. Um, different ethnicities and things like this. I don't want to misquote the results and what they found, but I know that they they have been some work on that. And indeed, it seems like if you change your perception of yourself, like even the physical one, like purely the bodily image, then it very quickly changes also the way you perceive the world and so on. So Okay, yeah. yeah. A lot of people are dreaming that we could teleport, you know, and teleportation and so on. And so let's imagine that we can although it's like super complicated, but let's imagine that we can teleport. Which effect would that have on the on the perception of yourself? Like, the, the, is it the same person? You, do you get the same person at the end of the process of teleportation than at the beginning? Like, because it will be the same body, the same atoms, etc. The, the, what you have is like a very sophisticated machine that can disembody you and then re-embody you atom per atom at the output and do that very quickly, very efficiently in the same order. But is it still the same person? Is it still the same self? It's a question I'm actually asking myself. I think that, uh, yeah, it has been explored in philosophy, like the sheep of Theseus, you know, or the swamp, I think the swamp man experiment or something. It's like if, if at the same time you disappear and then the same you are reconstructed basically somewhere else, is it still you or not? For teleportation, I would say it depends on the mechanism of teleportation. It's, if it's really like a, you know, they take the same atoms, even though what is what is the, the same atom, you know? <laughs> I don't think they have a, like a ident- identifier, but nonetheless, if you took the same kind of atoms and move them, then yes, it would be, it would be still you. But if you, as you say, if you basically destroy and copy, like in the, What's the movie, you know, the magic uh, about uh, in the end we discover... Uh, never mind, there is yeah, a... doesn't drink a bell. And I spoiled you the end, so I shouldn't, <laughs> go, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't tell more about it. Anyway, and um, so if indeed they, um, you know, they dis- make you disappear and then, re- em- as, as you say, re-embody you, I don't know. It's like, you know, very... A few years ago, there was uh, an Italian surgeon that was claiming that he could do a... Um, a transplant, yeah. A transplant he could do a transplant of a head on another body. So basically, and the question then became whether he's transplanting a head on a body or a body of someone on a, on a head, basically, because we know that there is the body is so important in our, cog- you know, in our, in our cognition and conscious experience. So if you attach a different head with a different body, like, you know, it would be very interesting to investigate, you know, this uh, type of patients. And so, um, yeah, I don't think currently we have a good, like, empirical, you know, example to use to study it. So I, I think, yeah, it's... Uh, okay, but that's definitely, these are fascinating questions. I'm like, that's also why I like physics more and more is that you, know, you guarantee some mind-blowing questions coming up very quickly. <laughs> things that you had never thought about before. And so to go back to your work, I saw on on your lab's website that you also say that these aspects of reality bending and so on relate to the core self as as we just talked about, but also that it like the cognitive abilities unfold into personality traits and neuropsychological profiles. So can you talk about that and I'm guessing I'm guessing that also answers another question I have which is why is this important? Like, why are you working on that? Basically, what do you think the application then could be? I will start with your with the end of your question, and uh, or maybe not. Yeah, about the cognitive profiles, and it's basically that you know, as neuropsychologist, neuropsychology has a a field that it likes to work and a framework that it likes to think, and it's the really this neurocognitive kind of level. So, you know, below you have really the neuroscience, you know, neuroscientific kind of mechanisms, like, you know, the neurons, the chemical in processes that are going on. On the very high level, you have all the psychological mechanisms, uh, 
that are operating and in between there are, there is this cognitive kind of level and we with these kind of general or more general or specific processes like inhibition working memory perception you know language and so on and so this is really kind of the the field in which neuropsychologists tend to work in not only them of course but you know we like that and so we what we usually do for instance with patients in clinical practice is to measure these cognitive functions and we treat them as abilities meaning that let's say inhibition you know i mentioned the the possible involvement of inhibition in like aesthetic judgment at the at the beginning and so at the same time it's a process it's something that you can recruit and that you can use you know pre- more or less vol- vo- voluntarily but it's also an ability in the sense that some people have better inhibitory abilities than others essentially you know and so by measuring these abilities as traits or as i characteristics we get a cognitive profile so for instance like oh this person has very you know high executive functions abilities but uh, you know low language or perceptual or something some other kind of abilities and so this shapes a profile and this profile has been related to some psychiatric or neurological disorders for instance we know that you know alzheimer disease is characterized by specific impairments in specific cognitive subdomains of memory we know that schizophrenia has also a bit i mean i mean very it's very a lot of variety but still there is a, a profile too and so on and so forth and so i was mentioning earlier that you know we could that personality could be related to the way we see and we experience reality and that by assessing the way we experience and see reality we could maybe make inferences on personality and so i would like to also investigate like this the role of these cognitive abilities you know where maybe people that have better executive functions or higher interoceptive abilities you know that are more connected in a way to their bodily signals and to their body maybe these people experience the way in a slightly different way experience the world sorry in a slightly different ways than say people that have very poor or very low interoceptive abilities or you know or some other types of stuff you know maybe people with a very developed language also perceive the world you know in a truly in a truly intuitive way maybe the the conscious the conscious the phenomenological kind of experience is different as compared with someone with a different cognitive profile yeah and and to to try to uh, and, and answer your second question which is the big question which is why is it relevant i don't have a to be entirely honest with you i don't have a you know a a very good answer i don't know maybe maybe it's not or maybe it's just you know a, maybe this framework is no good maybe it's uh, i don't know i just i just feel like it's something fundamental to our experience and the problem of these fundamental aspects is that they are so transparent you know it's like even consciousness we consciousness is really we don't see it because it's the way we experience things right and there are many things like this and so the they are fundamental but they are very hard to catch and to study and to make them salient so yeah same goes with the sense of reality you know the beliefs the like when we watch a movie we know we don't often think whether it's real whether it's not what does it change and so on but it seems like for instance it does have an effect at least on emotions so yeah so it's a question that is remains to be answered mm. yeah but from what i understand like having these ability to measure and map these cognitive processes of how we experience reality and how this perception of reality changes depending on the circumstances or experiences can help you in some medical diagnoses for instance that's uh, yeah that's indeed a, a very a very good point is that if we manage to well, to develop some robust markers of alterations of consciousness or the sense of reality we can then probably at the same time it can help the diagnosis of some pathologies but also help the care and it's true that for instance like when i was studying fiction you know so it was on a very philosophical most i mean it came from a philosophical paradox but i realized that fiction or the mechanisms of fiction to induce emotion regulation was actually used by therapists by cognitive behavioral therapists you know when they do exercises of like exposition in imagination or when they do some even in virtual re- reality nowadays or when they do like alternative thoughts generation and then they they try to to diffuse or to decrease the the feeling i mean the belief of the in the reality of these kind of thoughts 
it's really they are playing on these kinds of mechanisms in order to help the patients to you know regulate their emotions. So in that sense, for the clinical aspect, yes, there is definitely avenues for, I mean, it's definitely important in that area. Yeah, so like both in being able to diagnose earlier, maybe, and then also being able to care, to cure, sorry, these these disease beats, and you, you understand better how they appear. Okay, yeah. Fascinating. And so time is flying by, but I still have some time for, for I think, two questions before the last two questions. So I guess that listeners have, uh, have understood that gaining insights into those processes can be very challenging and probably often requires developing new statistical methods. And so I guess that's also why you end up creating new GitHub projects often. So I'm wondering if you can maybe take an example from your work to illustrate what being a reality pending researcher means in practice. Yeah, sure. I mean, about, you know, about the, the relationship with software, mm -hmm. it's I to to make you a, a, a confidence. I, I think I don't have data on it, but I think that most of the open source projects I mean, many of them, at least, maybe not most, but at least many of them were not made really for altruistic reasons of like providing tools to other users. I think that one of the, you know, really first kind of drive is to, for the people to have tools for their own usage, basically. And so this is true with, for instance, what we are doing now with, with NeuroKid, uh, a Python package for uh, neurophysiological processing is that we are implementing a lot of entropy or complexity kind of quantification of uh, for EEG and other and heart rate. And so we are really pushing on that front because we believe that these measures might be relevant in order to quantify the sense of reality and consciousness and so on. But really the, the main challenge, I would say, of a reality bender, if you, <laughs> if I can use this term, <laughs> is the the integration of different fields, you know, we have, for instance, we have re recently welcomed a, a new member in our, in our team. And it's true that there is a lot of different levels to it because first there is like, we use different neuroimaging techniques, you know, that are like EEG or other phys bodily signals. Then you have to know what it means, how to record them, you know, how to have a proper signal. Then you need to know how to, to learn how to process them, you know, using Python or, or anything else. What features to extract, you know, for EEG, there is a, a thousand different features is, and even the processing pipeline is not like well established. And once you have the features, then you have to learn stats, you know, to use like to do Bayesian additive general mixed uh, models. It's not even the end. And once you have all the, the, the results, you still have to combine all of these fields I just mentioned, you know, uh, like consciousness science, uh, cyber psychology, embodied cognition, and so on, in order to try to, you know, make sense of the results, discuss them in a meaningful way, and so on. So I think that the main challenge is this integration, this multi, at the same time, multi, almost multidisciplinary kind of integration between the different fields, but also between different skills. So there is like, you know, many technical elements with R Python. And there is also like more theoretical kind of uh, knowledge and, and, and aspects to combine. That's definitely something that you always have to have in mind in those cases. And so I'm wondering, what do you think is, uh, what was one of your maybe favorite projects that you worked on? And it can be favorite because it was particularly hard, but in the end you, you made it or it can be just it was super interesting intellectually. Oh, I think that uh, my favorite project is always the one that I'm, is always the one that I don't have to work on at one point in time. So if I have a deadline for one project, then this project is like, no, not good. And another project becomes very interesting. And then usually after, a, at the end of one project, it starts to, the appeal starts to decrease, you know? Huh. And so I think that my favorite projects are the ones that I, I haven't yet started. And so for instance, we have currently, you know, we want to investigate like, again, this, this relationship between the fractal and entropy indices uh -huh. and how do they relate to, to consciousness and sense of reality. 
So that's one thing I'm really excited for. We also have studies on on deception, for instance. You know, I didn't mention, but my first postdoc was on on deception and lying, and it's also you. It could be seen as a more active way of bending reality as a as a almost direct way of bending reality because it's like creating you know information that we know is not true so we also have like you know interesting projects on on that and how it relates to interoception for instance so i think that said if i had if i had to mention one of my favorite study that that or project that we did is uh, was during my phd we went to you know there was the movie avengers that came out mm-hmm. And we went to like we use this as going. an opportunity to do <laughs> as an opportunity to do an in-field study. So we we were interested in like the sense of presence, so is and how immersion, so like modulation of the quality of the experience could change the sense of presence. And so we the we hypothesized that you know. 3D should be more immersive than 2D, and therefore might people might feel more present and therefore might experience more, for instance, emotions and have a better memory of the movie. And so we went to, we went at the, uh, you know, at the end of every movie session and we, we asked, we did like administered questionnaires and yeah, it was, this was a, a nice, I think project because it was like, not, not as the, you know, it wasn't a, like a lab, traditional lab study. So it was uh, fairly fun to do and you know and um, we had interesting results we, sh- we showed that even though there was no differences between 2d and 3d but indeed like the the, re- the reports on the presence during the movie was connected with memory of the of the movie and emotions uh, maybe a last topic i'd like to touch on before closing up is um the epistemological aspect to our research because that's something i'm very nerdy about so you 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 try to understand what you're doing in a larger historical and philosophical context. Yeah, can you talk about that? So that's a very broad question, but maybe to narrow it down would be basically what is the history of psychology and psychiatry and how that relates to what you're doing today? And then maybe where do you see things going in the sense that what do you think are the methods and the tools of tomorrow? <clears throat> Thanks for not narrowing the question. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's still very, I was kind of realizing, I was like, <laughs> wait, broad. did I narrow that down? I actually <laughs> did not. <laughs> I just reframed it. But you know what I mean? I mean, I, like also big, yeah, big, fair enough, big fair things enough. that you, you want to talk about in, in that question. I think like you, I've always been fascinated by you know, the history and how we got there essentially. And I had the chance that the opportunity that my uh, official PhD supervisor, because it was a complicated story, but my official one was also a very involved in the history of psychology. And so we, we collaborated around some papers about the early founding, French founding fathers of psychology, like Alfred Binet or Théodule Ribot. And, um, but on more broadly, yeah, I'm, I'm, really fascinated by, you know, how the past has shaped the present and how it shapes essentially the the future and how much we are influenced by these early thinkers and early theories. And I do collect like old books of neuropsych, uh, of neurology or, um, or psychology. And it's really crazy to see, you know, the depth of these, of some of the theories of these thinkers is like truly humbling, you know, to be, to be aware of all that has been done and, and of these people that, that essentially made it. And one thing I noticed is that it's just, I mean, it always amazes me how much the, our belief systems and the, also the moral systems, you know, as people and societies can change very, very quickly, you know, like what is good and bad today will probably be very different in a hundred years and was very different a hundred years ago, or, you know, even without mentioning like thousands of years ago, right? And that's something like when reading these more, I mean, they are still recent in the, in the, in the big picture of history, but when reading these early attempts about on, his, on psychology, at least, I really try to be also cautious, you know, seeing not to see the past exclusively through the lens of the present. And yeah, I think also it's good not to see the present only exclusively also through the, through the, you know, through the lens of the past, because these kind of anachronisms and, you know, logical fallacies can, you know, are a recipe for, can be a recipe for dark times. But um, 
Yeah, coming back to the to the history of psychology in particular, I think it's some of something that I think about or that I uh, would like to mention is that it really makes me realize how much we are living currently in a revolution because previously, like uh, even you know, eight years ago or fifty years ago, these psychologists were very limited by the tools. You know, they they didn't have like neuroimaging they didn't have many many even on the statistical side you know it was like oh you can do a correlation maybe an analysis of variance and you know a t-test and that's about uh, that's about it so they were really limited by the means of doing whereas now we have shifted in a you know in we are shifting in the opposite kind of world in which we are surrounded by different statistical procedures you know i see papers on new models and new packages implemented pretty much every day. And even in neuroimaging, there is like new, newer and newer and newer techniques. And so the question now becomes, you know, no, it, it does, it's not anymore how to do something, but it's really what to do, you know, what do I do with all these tools? And uh, yeah, that's, that's really becoming, I think, a challenge, especially for the future, you know, the, the young researchers and so on. It's like there is what you know, not to be drawn in this sea of new techniques, uh, new analysis, uh, new methods, and so on. So, um, and on the other hand, you know, we could, we often hear that, you know, psychology in particular has become more and more skill-based, you know, more and more related to like heavy technical aspects, you know, a lot of skills is, are required in programming, in, uh, in in statistics. And that before that, you know, 70 years ago, it was like mostly theory building, you know, mostly like thinking and that there was less applied or like less techniques involved. But actually, you know, in, in the, it's not that true either, because like in the, for instance, in the, at the Institute of Psychology in the, in, at the University of Paris, we have like a small museum with some of the tools that were designed and manufactured by these early psychologists so that there is like stuff to uh, try to accurately measure reaction times. There are like, you know, wooden devices to measure the perception of colors. And so even, you know, many of the early psychologists were actually much very involved in pushing, you know, the technical side. And it's, I think you mentioned in one of your shows, you know, that it's very strange how many statistical advances or statistical norms have been somehow developed by by psychologists. It seems like psychology and statistics are somehow particularly connected, or at least, you know, psychologists, they, when they need the tools, they would usually, I mean, they can become, you know, engineers and builders and develop them on their own. So, yeah, I think that's one of the really, the thing that I love about psychology is that it's so much connected to many different fields, it's lying at the intersection and it's, you know, so rich. There is so many components, so many things we can do. It's just, um, yeah, it's truly blessing, I would say. <laughs> yeah, I like that. And yeah, I think, I think it's a good, it's a good place to, to close up the show on these, on these high notes. So thanks a lot, Dominique. But before leaving, you know uh, what you have to do. Answer the last two questions. I ask every guest at the end of the show. So, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? That's a good question. Can I come up with something that is not really a problem, but like a but that could be useful? I think that one of the the challenge that I would like to somehow contribute to would be to find a way of making people experience a fundamentally different conscious experience. You know, because it's we, we, we mentioned that we are really bounded by our sensory experiences. You know, we, we see a very narrow range of colors of, we, we hear a very narrow range of frequencies and there are some techniques, you know, to, to try to improve that. But usually it's either like, you know, we mentioned psychedelics, but it's either a modification of, of, of these sensory things or are, or a different connectivity between them, for instance, like hearing, colors or seeing sound, you know, they, 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 they swap the different sensory kind of uh, inputs or, but truly like, how is it to be like a dog or a bat, you know, <laughs> to, to, to see the world in this fundamentally different way. And it, and is it even possible, like with our brain, can we, you know, can it be repurposed to see, I don't know if we connected like all the sensory inputs of a, 
you know, all the sensory devices of a dog. I mean, it's not really a device, but all the sensory appendices, you would say, of a of an animal. Like, would it work basically? And I, I mean, it's a very, it's something that I tend to to think a lot. And I, I believe that if we were were able to easily, you know, change brains, essentially, like you know, to swap up between experiencing different views, you know, fundamentally different views, like different people, but also different animals or whatnot it would truly have a great impact on society. I think that, you know, the, the society is, is currently built on or related to the way, to the way humans perceive the world. But if, you know, if this aspect was richer, then it would surely impact society. I don't know how, and I don't know why, and I don't know whether it would be a good thing or not, but, uh, yeah, I think that's something that I could spend a few millennia working on, I guess, if I had uh, unlimited time. I love that. And probably that could help us maybe develop more empathy if you can mm. if you can experience life from a completely different point of view. I think like yeah, developing empathy is particularly hard because you try to do that, but in the end it's super hard to just like try and like experience reality as someone else. Mm. It's just, it's just it's impossible right now. So yeah. Yeah, what we are really doing is we are just like adopting what we think of others you know we are thinking adopting basically like their priors and you know and trying to sh shape our experience based on what we believe of the others but truly changing yeah. our perspective yeah it's really very hard yeah definitely and second question if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind dead alive or fictional who would it be i think for Contemporary scientists at dinner party with Lisa Feldman Barrett, which is a researcher on emotions, and Anil Seth, one of my inspiration, and Carl Friston would be a nice, uh, that would be lovely. But in a, in a alternate reality or, you know, maybe a virtual one, I would love to go to a Napolitan pizzeria with uh, Gandalf and Yoda and Schopenhauer <laughs> and maybe also Hannibal Lecter or, or maybe not. Or, maybe not, maybe yeah. only if the menu is vegetarian. Yeah, yeah. You're not sure that you're going to get out of that dinner otherwise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. I uh, love that. Well, thanks a lot, Dominic. It was just um, as expected, like very eye-opening on a lot of topics. And I'm really glad we did that because these are topics I, I had never talked about yet on the show. And, and yet they are, I think, really fascinating and connecting with a lot of a lot of fields in research and, and, and in your life. So I'm really happy we did that. I hope people will enjoy that episode as much as I did. As usual, I put resources and a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Et encore, merci beaucoup Dominique d'avoir pris le temps et d'être venu dans ce podcast. Merci beaucoup and thanks again and it was a great great pleasure to be here and so yeah you bet come back anytime and and next time I'm in Singapore I'll make sure to get a Bayesian beer with you well and and maybe an evil lecture we'll see. Sounds great. <laughs> see you. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Bayesian by Baba Brinkman, with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn base stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good base and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good base and change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation.